You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. It is not experiences that change us. As I mentioned in my last talk, people's lives pretty much fall into similar patterns, good things and bad things, obstacles and smooth roads, steep hills, deep rivers to cross. But it's not the steep hills and the deep rivers that change us. It is our response. A Christian's response should be very different from that of a non-Christian. Sometimes people call themselves Christians and you could study their lives minutely and you might have a great difficulty in discovering that there was really very much difference between them and anybody else. I know some Christians in whom the difference is obvious. The difference is radical. And I'd like to tell you the story today about a very lonely man, a man who experienced one of the most poignant forms of loneliness, rejection by his fiance. His name was George Matheson. And George Matheson was engaged when he went blind. And when he became blind, his fiance decided that she did not want to be stuck with a blind man as a husband. And she broke the engagement. Now, what exactly did Matheson do? Well, for one thing, he wrote a, a poem which has become a hymn, one of my favorite hymns, and I think it describes the process of what he went through in his grief and loneliness. These are his words. O oh, love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe, that in thine ocean depths its flow may richer, fuller be. That's just the first stanza, and I'd like for us to think about that for a minute. O oh, love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe. He gave back his life. He surrendered himself. And through that, he discovered that in thine ocean depths, its flow could richer and fuller be. His blindness and rejection proved to be for George Matheson the very means of illuminating the love of God. He may have asked the age-old question, why? But God's answer is always, trust me. Matheson turned his thoughts away from the woman he had lost, away from the powerful temptations to self-pity, resentment, and bitterness at God, skepticism of his word, and selfish isolation which might so quickly have overcome him, and he lifted up his weary soul to a far greater love, one that would never let him go. Have you ever been rejected by someone you loved? Perhaps not a fiancé, but someone on whom you really counted. Someone that you had assumed, perhaps for years, really loved you. And then, in a strange and unexpected way, that person has turned from you. And you've known the desolation that George Matheson experienced. The woman who had promised her life to him decides, no, it's not worth it. It's not worth the price with a blind man. Where do you turn? He turned to the love that will never let go, the love of God. He gave him back his life. So often we have misgivings about turning over our lives to God, imagining that we're going to lose everything that matters. As I think I've told you, I live on the ocean, and I think a lot about the ocean and about the tiny shells that we can find in the tide pool in front of our house. Suppose that tiny shell, lying in a dry spot on low tide, was afraid to give up the teaspoonful of water that it holds lest there not be enough in the ocean to fill it up again. I think our hesitancy to turn over our lives to God would be like that of the tiny shell. Is there enough 
in God to fill our hearts. Lose your life, said Jesus, and you will find it. Give up, and I will give you everything. As Janet Erskine Stewart puts it, if we get our own way, we get only a hideous little idol to nurse. If we give it up, we get God. Can the shell imagine the depth and the plenitude of the ocean? Can you and I fathom the riches and the fullness of God's love? In his blindness, George Matheson must have thought a great deal about light. There is a second stanza to the hymn that George Matheson wrote. It says, O light that followest all my way, I yield my flickering torch to thee. My heart restores its borrowed ray that in thy sunshine's blaze its day may brighter, fairer be. Wouldn't you imagine that a man who goes blind would think a great deal about light? He says, O light that followest all my way, I yield my flickering torch to thee. A flickering torch. Does that mean that he has to sacrifice his only source of light? He yields. When his heart restores its borrowed ray, what happens? In place of his own dim torch, he is given God's sunshine blaze. Because the thing that he longed for, the joy of his life was gone, he cried out in his desperation to another joy, to the source of joy itself. And here's the third stanza. O joy that seekest me through pain, I cannot close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain and feel the promise is not vain that morn shall tearless be. I cannot close my heart to thee. Think about that. I wonder if for a moment or two Matheson might have felt the way I sometimes do. I will not relinquish this misery, not right now. God has taken away what I most wanted. I have a right to feel sorry for myself. I have been wronged. I will refuse, for a while at least, any offers of comfort and healing. Don't speak to me of joy. You pour salt in my wounds. I just want to lie in the corner and lick them for a little while. If any such very natural thoughts entered Matheson's mind, as I imagine they did, God understood, for he had been a man too. In his mercy, he helped him to put them away and to write, I cannot close my heart to thee. That is the response of a humbled heart, one that admits its poverty and recognizes the gentle love that waits, the joy that is seeking him precisely because he is in such pain that he can hardly seek anything but death. Then, even though he is blind, he sees with the eye of faith, and what he sees through the mist of his tears is a rainbow. He comes to believe that the promise is true. Tears are not forever. Sorrow is never forever. There will be a mourning without them. His faith lays hold of the promise, and mysteriously he finds that pain has been exchanged for joy. I've known that too. That's happened many times in my life. If Matheson or you or I, close our hearts and indulge our feelings, we may find some miserably meager happiness. But we would forfeit the joy, and it's joy that he writes about in that third stanza. O oh, joy that seekest me through pain. It's God. That joy is God seeking you through pain. But you say, if God loves me, he'll make me happy. Well, yes and no. Happy isn't the word, really. It's joy, a better thing, a far better thing. Not sentiment, not mere feeling good, but something that can never be taken away. Love, light, and joy. There is yet something else that the God who is love and the Father of lights and the source of all joy wants to give us. It's the cross. Will we accept that? It can always be evaded, but if it is, the result is endless loss. Matheson writes about that too. O cross that liftest up my head, I dare not ask to fly from thee. I lay in dust 
life's glory did. And from the ground there blossoms red life that shall endless be. I dare not ask to fly from thee, he says. By this time he understands what he would be rejecting. With both hands, as it were, he takes it, says yes, surrenders, lays everything he holds dear, life's glory, down in the dust. <laughs> 